Some of you are excited about that. And some of you had probably the experience I'm having when I put uh, this month's board minutes from the Hillside Board meeting, financial reports, I filed them in the board binder on Friday, and, and, and I had that sort of revelation again of like, wow, we're halfway through the year. <laughs> it's like, wow, another year and we're halfway through, and uh, praise God. Um, you know, part of it is because of all the great things God is doing, and of course, the challenges that we're going through. Uh, and, and life is, um, in fact, in the Bible, uh, you know, life is often compared to uh, a, a ship at sea. And the reason for that is because, uh, you know, it was a seafaring culture. Uh, it, was either, it was either walking, you know, camel, donkey, uh, or, or ship. And of course, that's not really our perspective today. We don't walk. <laughs> Some of us we walk, but you know we only walk because of our our watches and our steps, and they annoy us, you know. But like, we drive, we fly, you know. We don't we don't take ships to Europe, you know. And uh, but of course, in the in the biblical context, uh, ships were a big deal, and and of course the sea was this big unknown and and a, sort of a monster of a of a thing. And so often in the Bible, you'll have you know, life compared to a ship at sea. And what's interesting about this book we're studying, we're studying the book of Hebrews. We started that about five weeks ago. If you have a Bible today, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 6. That's where we're going to be today. We're moving through pretty quickly. Uh, there's lots here that we're leaving behind, and I, and I hope you'll engage in some study of your own. Um, but in this book, there's about there's 13 chapters, and almost every chapter has a warning in it. Uh, about falling away, about giving up, about getting distracted, about adding to the gospel uh, that Jesus isn't enough, you need something else, you need something in addition. And there's warning after warning after warning, and, and of course chapter 5, we're going to end chapter 5 today, we're going to jump into chapter 6, and uh, again, there's another warning, because life is like the sea, and your soul is like a ship in that sea. And, and sometimes, and probably for a lot of us in the room, you know, our soul is like, is like breaking against the, wa- the waves and the breakers of the sea, as my first picture here I pulled off the internet. Uh, this, probably rep- this probably represents most of our feeling about life. You know, we are just like busting through, Pastor. I'm hanging on. I'm taking on water. I'm bailing, you know, water off my boat. It's 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 tough out there. And we get about an hour in here and we get to sing faithful faithful you are uh and we know that when we step out these doors uh that faithfulness is pressed because of the breakers and the ship, you know, heading into the storm. Uh, some of us live in fear. Uh, you know, we're, we don't want to leave harbor. Uh, I used to have a, a big poster that hung in my office years ago that, you know, said uh, ships are safe in harbor, but ships aren't made for the harbor. They're made for the, the open seas. And so your soul wasn't made for safety. It was made to live life, but life's like those waves. But I have this boat, it's kind of anchored in harbor, and you know, that, that looks pretty cool, right? But it's going nowhere, right? And then I, I love this next picture because it, it expresses the moodiness of life, the ship at night and the waves and, and, you know, tempest, and it's dark and moody and there's some sunlight, but there's darkness, and maybe, maybe that's, you know, it's like, you know, yesterday was great, but I'm headed into darkness, or maybe you're headed out of darkness, and there's a glimmer of hope, and there's real concern in this book about falling away from Christianity. These Christians we're reading about in Hebrews, they were, they were Jewish Christians in the Roman Empire, an empire that was persecuting Christians was killing Christians, was alienating Christians, uh, and people were falling away. And of course, what do you do when you fall away? And what do you do when your family member falls away? And 
how hard it can be. And, and there may be some of you today, I, I like this picture. Uh, maybe you feel like you're sinking already. <laughs> that's me, Pastor. That's me. Uh, we have help for you here. We want to get your ship back on track, you know. We want to, we want to plug the hole in the hall of your soul. I mean, that, rock, that was beautiful. It wasn't even in my ass. That's like the hall of your soul. Man, ooh, that was beautiful. I'm, I'm like a poet and didn't know it. And then, I mean, and then this, this is, of course, this is my favorite one. Look at these two best buddies. They're just, they're, I mean, this is, how we, this is how we want life to be, right? I mean, these guys, you know, they're chilling. I don't know. They're listening to K-Love, you know, or something. I don't know. Like, it's like, come on, man. That's not realistic, you know? It's like just beautiful waves and just, you know, calm. And uh, who knows what that beautiful mansion is or lighthouse in the background, you know? It's just like... These boys are just chilling. Oh, man. Life is like the sea, and your soul is like a ship at sea. And here's what Hebrews chapter 6 tells us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor for our soul. Now, I'm diving deep into chapter 5 and 6, right? This, this verse, verse 19, is toward the end. And, uh, you know, on a Sunday, it's hard to cover everything. So I just wanted to drive right to the point. We have this, and what has been talked about in the previous verses is the gospel, the good news. We have this, Hillside Church, those watching online, those in the room, we have this, the Word of God, the Gospel. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. When life throws at you the wind and the waves, a hope, this Scripture says, that enters into the inner place beyond the curtain. Like it's... It, it, it's broken, that hope that's broken through the curtain, the Holy of Holies, that's what it's talking about, the, the temple, it's broken through and it's grabbed on. And you remember Tyler's message a couple weeks ago, if you were here, about drifting. It's just something that's grabbed deep in, right? We have this hope where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, my behalf, your behalf, having become a high priest, that's the conversation we had last week, Jesus being the mediator. So having become, Jesus has become the, a high priest, a mediator forever. Not just a year. Most high priests, priests in the Old Testament, if you read about it in our Bibles, they served for a year. But not Jesus. Forever after the order of Melchizedek. We're going to talk about Melchizedek next week, so you just have to hold on. But Jesus is the forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever. Not just yesterday, not just today, not just tomorrow, but forever. He's going to work on your and my behalf. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor. I want to talk to you today about why the gospel is sure, can be trusted, and why the gospel is steadfast. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend some time today talking about why you should build your life on the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Very simply, could be summarized, for God so loved the world that He gave his one and only Son, Jesus, that whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, will not die, will not be shaken, but has eternal life. Amen. That's the gospel. If you want to just summarize it as simply as possible, you have been saved by grace. Grace, the grace of God. And I'm telling you, the Bible's telling you, I want you to know by the end of today, this is a sure and a steadfast anchor. And we need an anchor. 
I know some of you are worried about Trump being elected as president in November. I know some of you are worried about Harris being elected as president in November. I'll tell you, I'm worried about both. I have an anchor for my soul that's deeper, that's sure, that's more steadfast. Hallelujah. Number one, here's why it's sure. Here's why the gospel is sure. An anchor for your soul. Because it's the work of God alone. It's not based on your work. It's not based on your performance. It's not based on your faithfulness. There's a song in the Bible. Paul writes to Timothy. And in the song, he breaks the pattern for one reason and one reason only. He breaks the pattern of the psalm, the the poem he's writing, because he gets to the faithfulness of God. And he breaks the pattern and he says, if you are faithless, Timothy, God remains faithful. Your salvation, the activity of God in your life, in your heart, in your family, at your business, at work today in the world, God's activity is not dependent on you. You can bank on it. You can bet on it. You can base your life on it. You can anchor yourself in it. You can anchor yourselves in a lot of other things. You can anchor yourself in the next vacation. You can anchor yourself in money. You can anchor yourself in peace of mind. Uh, There's lots of things you can anchor yourselves in, and they're fleeting. They're wasting away. They're they're shakable. But there's only one thing. The Greek word here is to, to not allow something to totter. You know, like when you stand on something, maybe a rock in a riverbed as you're trying to skip across, you know, a riverbed to get to the other side and all of a sudden you step on a rock, right? No, that's not this rock. This gospel, this word that we're basing our lives on is a sure word. It is secure. Now, I made up a word for this purpose today. Here it is. It is untotterable. It works. It's untotterable. It doesn't totter, right? It's sure. Why? Because it's not based on your faithfulness. Well, I I didn't I didn't act like I should have yesterday. Well, okay, ask for forgiveness and get right with God. Get your life back on track. Don't wallow in that. It's not based on you and your performance. Well, I wasn't faithful last year. Well, I didn't give in the offering. Well, start giving. I didn't pray. Well, start praying. It's not based on you. It's based on God. If it was based on me, if it was based in my works, boy, it would not be a sure foundation, an anchor. Here's what the Bible says. Except a man be born again. Now, if you solve the born again thing, And I don't think medical science is ever going to be able to solve that. It's appointed for a man or woman to be born once. How does does one get born again, Nicodemus asked. Jesus. Yes, Jesus. How, how, How are you born again? Except a man or woman be born again, he cannot, she cannot see the kingdom of God. That is not a work you can do. To be regenerated, to have your thinking just be transformed, your mindset in a moment. Some of you have experienced that. You're like, I'm different. Well, absolutely you're different. You've been born again. And it's not something I convinced you of. My preaching's not that good. This church isn't that good. It's a beautiful place that God has given us here. But we're not that good. God can change your life. R.C. Sproul says this. R.C. Sproul, great preacher, passed away now. He says, no man has the power to raise himself from spiritual death. Divine assistance is necessary. Clear. Jesus needs to come and set you free. Now, of course, this untotterableness, you like that, don't you? Yeah. What brings our author, 
What brings our author to this statement? We have this, a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul, a hope that enters in to the inner place behind the curtain. What, what brings our author to that statement? Well, it's the preceding paragraph. If you go to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, it's going to be up on the screen. For it is impossible, this is a highly debated paragraph. Christians have argued about this for centuries. It is, it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and have then have fallen away. So you, you had relationship with God, you were, you, you, you were part of the kingdom of God, you had accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, right? And you've fallen away. Are you tracking with this? It's impossible, that first word, it's impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. And again, I told you, Christians are being persecuted. They're falling away, right? We dealt with that last week. Where do you, where do you go when you fail? You need a mediator. Where, where do you go when you when you offend God and you walk away, throw up your hands and say, I don't care if you're faithful, I'm walking. What, what do you do when you offend God so deeply? And that's this paragraph, right? You, you, you just read it with me. Like you saw it, like it's still up there, throw it back up. Like, I mean, wh what are we going to do? And Christians, of course, have debated, oh no, and maybe you've heard these words. No, you're eternally secure. No one can take you out of God's hands. And then over here is another group of Christians saying, no, man, you can lose your salvation. And, and these people are living under fear and, and sort of a holiness-like conviction and sometimes a judgmental spirit. And these people over here are like eternally secured, so they're just doing whatever they want and sometimes not being a Christian because they're eternally secure. Both theologies create the wrong gospel. Here's the gospel. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He has loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Why is it impossible? Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. It's impossible because you can't talk someone into the gospel. It's only something that an individual coming to God and God doing a sovereign work of rebirth. That's why in the 70s and the 80s especially, it was a very popular term to say, I'm born again. We've kind of lost that. But that's the reality of it. Have you been born again? And only God can do that. He can transform your life. He can change you. And the sea may be just the same as it was. But He can see you through. Because He is a sure anchor for your soul. The second word, steadfast, I believe relates to Jesus because the object of the gospel is the rock, Jesus Christ. If the nature of the work is God's and, the, and then, then the object of the gospel is Jesus, right? Everything in the gospel centers us on Jesus. It points us to Jesus. God's doing this miraculous work in our hearts. God's doing this miraculous work and it's a work that's based on the the rock that is Jesus. Paul, the apostle, says to the Corinthian church, he says, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, 
which is Jesus Christ. If, if you don't make a decision to, to, be, to make Jesus your foundation stone, which means sold out, you, you've got to be sold, you've got to be sold out. A, a foundation stone is not steadfast unless you put all your weight on it. If you've got one foot or one post on a sure stone and another post or leg on an unsure stone, your, your building is not steadfast and secure. This word steadfast has to do with erosion. I just had the privilege to go to Italy in May and we're walking on streets that are 2,000, 3,000 years old. We're looking at statues of you know, stone that have eroded arms missing, fingers missing. I mean, some real deformed, you know, <laughs> deformed figures, you know, your nose is gone, you know. Uh, it's like, what's wrong with these statues, these people, these stones? They're not steadfast. Why would you ever build your life on two stones? Build your life on the foundation that is Jesus Christ. Get in Bible study. Follow Him. Get with other Christians. Pray. Ask God for help. He's here to help you. I love Cody Kearns' song, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Everything around me is shaken. I have never been more glad. Not because things are shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. You know, we sing these songs in America and because of, uh, because of the ease of our culture, we usually sing these songs with the context of like, I'm having a bad day. Yeah, Jesus, you're a firm foundation and everything around me is shaking. <laughs> like my car broke down and, you know, a, 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 you know, a sickness, a, uh, whatever, I hurt my knee, you know, it's like, I'm shaken. God help me, you won't fail. What if this song and the ideas of this song were really about something deeper? Like that no one can take you out of the hands of God and what His plan is for your life. I'm not minimizing those things, you know. When, when cancer hits us, we sing a song like this. When marriage conflict hits us, we sing a song like this. When, you know, kids are having trouble, we sing a song like this. I've still got joy in chaos. I got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going under, right? This is the ship analogy. I won't be going under. I've, uh, I've held I'm not held by my own strength because I've built my life on Jesus. Of course, it relates to all the challenges we go through. But what if it also relates to your eternity? That you're invincible. That you've got a hope beyond these 80 years. What if, it, what if this song really speaks to that deeper need in us? When everything around is shaken, I've got peace that makes no sense. I've walked with a lot of people through cancer. And as they get close to dying, many of them become invincible in a way because they're dying and they really start to grasp the reality of the security and the steadfastness of the gospel. We taught on heaven in 2019. You can look at those messages. They're online. Four weeks on heaven. And I argued in those four messages that what, what would it be like 
if while we were still young and healthy, we grabbed onto that mentality that we often grab when we're sick and dying. Oh man, Jesus is everything. I'm living for Him. I've got two months. I'm going hard. But what if you had 20 years and you went hard for Jesus? He's a sure, steadfast. Just three things really quick why Jesus is so steadfast for you and me. First, Jesus, the Bible tells us, is interceding for us. He intercedes for us. Uh, look, l- listen to what Romans 8 says, 8.34. 8, uh, <clears throat> who is to condemn? And this is the middle of a conversation, right? Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is to condemn us is the context. Christ Jesus is the one who died, so no one can condemn you. Jesus died. More than that, he was raised to life. Yes. So, so you're gonna, you, you're, you're, your life has been purchased by him. Who is at the right hand of God, Jesus, at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Interceding for us. Here, here's why you can step out of this room in about a half an hour and have this steadfast anchor for your soul. Because Jesus intercedes for you. Now let me help you, under, let, me, let me just try to help illustrate that a little bit, okay? <clears throat> some of you know, because we've taught some marriage stuff around here, that, that I bring my wife coffee just about every morning yeah. in bed. Now, the reason I bring her coffee every morning uh, in bed is because I, I want to start off with her liking me every day, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> the second reason is because a few years ago, I found out that she's interceding for me and for all our kids in the morning. Now, most mornings, so don't get religious on me, most mornings, okay? So I don't want you to think that we're better than we are. I mean, you know, most mornings, she's there, she's interceding. Now, here's, here's, here's what I'm trying to help you understand. I'm not, I'm not bragging on my wife. Here's what I want you to understand. Most, I, I don't think, now maybe, maybe the older kids know this now, but my kids have never known that. They, they don't know that. So, so th- that, that's, what, that's what it's like with Jesus He's interceding for you. So like, you know, when, when something happens in your life, right, it, it, the, the Daniel kids, they, they don't know if they, this, like something good happened, and I, I tell you right now, it's because their mama's interceding for them. They avoided a challenge. Man, they, they got through that thing. Wow, how, how, well, that's because their mama's interceding for them. Man, they're really wanting something, but their mama's interceding for them, so they're getting something else. Did you know Jesus is interceding for you? Which means, well, yeah, I'm asking Jesus for things. No, 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 no. He's interceding for you. You may not get what you're asking for, but he's going to give you something. He's interceding for you. You're going to walk out of these, this room in a few minutes. You're going to walk out into a world where Jesus is interceding for you. You're going to go to work tomorrow, and Jesus is going to be interceding right at the right hand of the Father. He's going to go, oh, man, watch my boy Eric. Boy, Eric has a tendency to mess himself up. So, you know, you watch him, you know, and, and Jesus is interceding for me. There's stuff that didn't happen to you yesterday because Jesus is interceding for you. There are moments you should have been discouraged and you weren't discouraged because Jesus was interceding for you. I'm so thankful, you know, my wife's interceding for me. Here, baby, take a cup of coffee and intercede for me. I don't know what she's praying, but usually it's good stuff, you know? <laughs> Who knows what she's praying, man? Woo! Forget my wife for a moment, my family. Jesus is interceding for you. You're not alone. You're not alone. And you may feel defeated. You may feel beaten down. You may feel like a ship that's sinking and Jesus is interceding for you. Not only is he interceding for you, he's expecting you to finish well. How does that sound? He believes in you. He's expecting you to finish well. What do I mean by that? Well, he's preparing a place for you. 
He's preparing a room with your name on it because he expects you to be there. He's expecting you to be in heaven with him forever. He wants you there. He's believing in you. He's praying for you. He's rooting for you. The Bible tells us, Jesus says to his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? So Jesus is saying, you know, I'm not lying. I wouldn't have told you something that's not true. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you also may be. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to die on a cross so that you didn't have to die because all who believe in Jesus get to go to heaven. You're, you're, there's a finish line, but the finish line is really like the next leg of the race into eternity. And Jesus is expecting you to be there. So if the expectation is going to find fulfillment then the anchor has to be sure and steadfast. Because if it's based on me and my efforts, I'm not going to make it. But it's based on his efforts. He's coming back for me and the work that God's done in my life. And then last, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 6, it ends with where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest, that mediator, forever. I already kind of tipped on that. Here's what I want to say about that as an application point. Jesus abides until the work is fulfilled in us, for us. He's interceding for you. He's expecting you to be there, and he's not going to give up. Because he's a steadfast anchor that doesn't erode. Because the message we believe, the gospel, that our sins can be forgiven, that we can have a new life in Christ, is untotterable. It is a sure foundation, a sure anchor for our soul. Now, after that passage I read to you about it being impossible for someone to come to repentance again, and in between, you have a sure anchor for your soul. This passage where it's like, it's impossible to find, to find salvation again, to find freedom again, and then you've got this sure anchor, comes these few words. This is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9. Though we speak in this way, so he had just talked about the apostasy, the falling away, right? It's impossible. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. I'm hoping for better things. In this group today, those watching online, those in this church, I'm hoping for better things in the Napa Valley. I'm hoping and believing for better things. Things that belong to salvation. God's house isn't full. There's a lot of houses in Napa of worship, uh, and they're not full yet of God's people. There are better things to come. Things that connect to salvation. For God is not unjust as to overlook your work. The love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. We desire each of you, the writer says, we desire each of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience Inherit the promise. If you're a Christian today, don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap a harvest.
through faith and patience, we inherit the promises of God. Don't give up. Don't give up. Believe in the gospel. Trust God. Trust in Jesus. It's a sure anchor for your soul. And today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've yet to ask God to forgive you of your sins in the name of Jesus, today you can be born again. Oh my gosh, how exciting to be born again. You may have attended this church for months, for years, and you've not been born again. It's possible. You don't get born again by hanging around. You get born again by surrendering your life to Jesus. Close your eyes with me for just a moment. Father in heaven, Father in heaven, help us to be faithful and patient. Help us to be faithful and patient, trusting the gospel, trusting in your work, Father, trusting in your plan for Jesus Christ being a firm foundation for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anyone today, keep your eyes closed for just a moment, is there anyone today and you need to get your life right with God? You've maybe been a Christian for a long time, but you walked away. It's not over for you. It's impossible for me to save you. It's impossible for you to save yourself. But with God, all things are possible. Maybe you've walked away and today's your homecoming. Or maybe you need to get right with God today and, you, and you, you've not asked Jesus Christ to forgive you in the past of your sin. And today you want to ask God to forgive you in the name of Jesus. If, if you're either of those groups, rededication or a first-time decision, could you just slip your hand up? I want to pray with you today. I see a hand in the back on the left here, right here. Just keep your hand up for a minute. Keep your hand up for a minute. Anyone else? Father in heaven, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's repeat after me together. We're a family with the person who's raised their hand. Repeat this prayer after me. Father in heaven, thank you for salvation. Thank you for the gift of forgiveness. I ask in the name of Jesus that you would forgive me of my sins. I want a new beginning. I want to be born again. I ask that you would do that today. In the name of Jesus Christ. Send your spirit to rest upon me today. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Can you stand to your feet today? <clears throat> I've got some friends up here on the right. I got some friends over here on the left. If you want to come forward for prayer today, uh, these men and women have come today with their hearts prepared. I mean, when they get dressed in the morning, they are, they are getting dressed with this moment in mind to pray for you. Jesus is interceding for you. They were interceding for you. They were praying. They were like, Lord, man, the service today, I'm on the prayer team. I don't know what need you walked in with. If you have a need today that you need to bring before God, we believe in a miracle working God. And so I would encourage you today before you leave the service, uh, if you raised your hand today or wanted to raise your hand and didn't, man, come today. Ask God to forgive you of your sins. Let one of these individuals help you, lead you in that prayer of forgiveness today. God bless you, Hillside. Pastor Caleb's going to come and dismiss you. So God bless you. Stay standing for a minute. Pastor Caleb will dismiss you. Let's make some noise for Pastor Eric one time for that amazing message. Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate that. 
Real quick, before you leave, if it's your first time or maybe you've been here a couple times and haven't gotten plugged in, there's a QR code on the backs of the chairs. Go ahead and scan that. We would love to get you plugged in. And then to my left and your right back here, there is a welcome center. We would love to give you a free gift, get you plugged in, and help you be part of the Hillside family. And again, prayer on to the left and the right. We would love to pray with you maybe about salvation, maybe about something going on in your life. But let's do this together. Amen. All right, Hillside, you guys are dismissed. Hope you have a great Sunday. Go enjoy some lunch. Go and go be with each other. Have a great day.